report report that's going to be finalized at the end of this month will include the impact of climate change on mental health for the first time. And this signals to all of us that this is a, glo a rising global awareness with an urgency to address these issues. So on that note, I am really delighted to uh, that you've joined today and to welcome our four panelists um, we have with us right now. And um, I will just briefly introduce them to you. And then I'm going to ask them just to talk to us, first of all, about what they're doing um, in the field at the moment. So our first speaker is Emma Lawrence, who is a mental health innovations fellow based at the Institute of Global Health and Innovation at Imperial College London. And um, working with her is Jessica newbury levey who is also a junior policy fellow in climate change and health, again, based at the Institute of Global Health and Innovation at Imperial College in London. And then we're really pleased to have two um, international collaborators. Um, the first is Brandon Gray, who's um, dialing in to us from the World Health Organization in uh, Geneva. And he is a technical officer working in the mental health unit in the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use at WHO in Geneva. And then finally, but not at all um, least, we have uh, Tilly Akena, who is working at the Red Cross Climate Center and is a technical advisor in climate and health. Um, so perhaps I could just start off, um, Emma, perhaps you could explain to us uh, your role at Imperial and, and what you've been um, working on in the field up till now. Uh, wonderful, thanks so much. Um, would you mind putting up the slides? Yes, wonderful. Okay, yeah, so so I'm the Mental Health Innovations Fellow, uh, as you outlined, Sophia, and as part of that role, um, I lead the program Climate Cares, and we're trying to both understand and respond to these interconnections between climate change and mental health. Now, some of you might have heard about this before, for others, you might not have sort of joined the dots together, but climate change and mental health are intricately linked. So climate change is a mental health emergency. We're hearing more and more how climate change is a health emergency um, and the physical health aspects have received increasing attention. And now mental health is uh, starting to catch up as you said with the IPCC report and um, talking about this for the first time. So we'll speak a little bit more about how climate change directly and indirectly impacts mental health, but Another uh, aspect to this, which is equally important and maybe doesn't receive as much attention yet, is how um, the well-being of our societies and the way that we are connected and work together, the, the internal work we do um, affects the external world. So the responses that we have to climate change, whether the thoughts and feelings we have, the psychological and emotional responses, ultimately interact with how we act as individuals, as communities, as, as systems, as decision makers and policy makers. And so because climate change is ultimately attributable to human behavior, we need to understand how our psychology and emotional responses interact with how we act. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So just to outline very briefly, um, the way that uh, climate change, as we know, is increasing uh, temperatures uh, and that has an effect on all sorts of things that we know we're seeing more um, extreme and frequent weather events and chronic climate events like droughts um, and these have a range of impacts so when we experience uh, or when people around the world experience extreme high temperatures directly that has um, mental health outcomes like increasing suicide rates more people going to hospital with symptoms of mental illness, people being more likely to die in a heat wave if they've got a pre-existing mental health condition and worse mental health across the population, but also experiencing um, extreme weather events, uh, you know, and directly. So if you experience the trauma of a flood or a fire, that has big impacts on mental health as well. But then there are these flow on events. So if we go from sort of our left to right across this continuum, you know, we see that communities are impacted in all sorts of ways in their livelihoods, in being forced to move from their homes, in loss of habitats, in, um, you know, impacts on cultures, particularly for people really strongly connected to the land, um, particularly Indigenous communities, for example, around the world. And then even onto the right, even if we're just hearing about these effects and um, anticipating them or witnessing them, 
that also has big uh, mental health impacts. And there can be a range of these as is on the bottom of the screen. So we're seeing um, more distress, understandably, and this can lead to diagnosable mental health conditions um, and uh, sadly also increased suicide rates in some cases. So if we go to the next slide, um, we want to outline these to policymakers. So these impacts that haven't been accounted for are accounted for in how we look at the costs of climate inaction and the benefits of action and the need to provide appropriate support as the other speakers will discuss. But we want to go beyond that as well and see that uh, actually there are common causes to some of these um, mental health uh, challenges that our society faces and wellbeing challenges and the climate crisis that they're ultimately uh, we need care that's better for people as well as better for the world and these interact so we can have sort of a vicious cycle of climate change impacting um, our health and our well-being and that affecting our ability to act but also we can have um, a virtuous cycle where we can try and transform society in ways that are really synergistic so we know, for example, that things like burning fossil fuels creates air pollution, which impacts physical and mental health. We know that if we're not connected to nature and don't have access to biodiversity, um, bad for us as well as um, that level of biodiversity, obviously, um, uh, you know, being a, a global crisis in itself. And so you can look at these things in, in the middle that what we need to do is work towards um, cultures of care and nurturance where we have societies that are more connected to each other and um, to nature, where there's uh, cleaner environments, where there's more active transport, healthier food systems, and all of these things will be good for us and our mental health and well-being, as well as the planet, and allow us to um, take action together if we can create opportunities to, to come together. And that action in itself is helpful for some of the, the distress um, that we feel when we feel hopeless and powerlessness in the face of climate change. So we need action from leaders, we need action um, in communities to help protect our mental health and well-being and allow us to continue to cope and act in the face of the climate crisis. Um, and that's one of the things that can really help stop distress um, and understandable distress leading into uh, mental health um, difficulties. So if we go to the next slide, I'm I think going to hand over to my colleague Jess to talk about how uh, we at Climate Cares are trying to respond to this. Emma, thank you so much. Jessica, can I just ask you um, briefly to introduce yourself um, to, the, to the group as well before you start talking about your specific pieces of work? And thanks very much, Emma. Um, I should have said earlier, um, apologies, um, that we would like you to post whatever questions you have to any of our speakers um, in the chat, and then we will get to those after you've heard a brief uh, summary from all four presenters. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica newberry Bay. I'm a junior policy fellow in the Institute of Global Health Innovation. Um, and my role kind of sits across climate change and health. So I work with Emma in the Climate Cares team. And we'll talk a bit more about what we're doing at the moment. Uh, but my role also has a kind of broader focus across climate and health systems, which is focusing on the role of health leaders and climate action. So in terms of what the Climate Cares team is and what we're doing, we're a very interdisciplinary programme. Uh, we bring together researchers, policy experts, designers, um, aiming to understand through research and support through interventions and awareness and education, mental health outcomes in the climate crisis. So we have three main streams of work, firstly around uh, building the global evidence base, one around awareness and education engagement, and a third one around uh, developing supportive solutions. In terms of the uh, global evidence base, this has been a kind of number of research studies which we've um, done today and have underway, uh, which are around kind of understanding the prevalence, the nature, the severity of mental health impacts uh, from climate change. And these have been exploring areas like young people's psychological responses to climate and COVID, which started in the UK. Uh, we're now working with teams in India, in the Philippines, in the Caribbean and the US. 
We've also done a meta-analysis on temperature and climate change and have studies underway looking at things like young people's perspectives on their feelings around climate change and what they want health professionals to know. Uh, surveys of mental health professionals to um, aim to understand their training needs and encourage policy action uh, and mapping the intervention landscape. In terms of awareness, last year we published a briefing paper which outlines the evidence on the impact of climate change on mental health and emotional well-being and also sets out recommendations for different stakeholder groups to take action uh, in policy and practice. We're also really aware of a growing demand for more training and more guidance in this area, uh, particularly coming from mental health practitioners because they're seeing more and more cases of climate related distress in the practice. But we're also getting um, kind of increasing calls from groups like teachers and civil servants and policymakers. So we're currently working and looking at how we can be developing educational courses and resources to help meet this training need. And finally, in the intervention space, we develop interventions across the kind of individual, community, and decision maker level. And this is around kind of creating spaces where people can reflect and process their emotions around uh, climate change imagine a more hopeful future and also understand their own role in taking action. Our key intervention to date has been a guided journal which has been co-created with young people in the UK as a tool to help young people process their emotions around uh, climate change and also COVID, building up things like self-care practices and envisioning a better world, um, how they can take action and so on. Uh, we've piloted this so far with young people in the UK but we'd love to look into scaling it up and expanding it. And we're also exploring how we can create these kind of spaces in community infrastructures such as schools and libraries and also at the decision maker level wanting to create spaces to bring decision makers together across sectors and silos um, and also creatively imagine the future they want to create. So I will stop there and hand back to you Sarah. Thank you Jessica. I've just got a quick question because I'm not an expert in this field and I'm absolutely fascinated by the work you're doing. How does the work you've described to us become visible? How, how do other people know you're doing this? Um, I know that's probably quite a big question, but I, I don't know if you or Emma can just briefly summarise that. No, absolutely, that's a fantastic question. And that's a really key part of our awareness stream as well, um, because a lot of the challenges at the moment are that the costs of mental health um, due to climate change are quite hidden and they're not quantified mm. and they're not known mm. so that awareness is a really key part um, as it is kind of building the evidence base to understand what those costs are in the first place um, so that's why things like our briefing paper that we did last year is around kind of making that information accessible to policymakers, and um, doing things like launch events seminars and talks and so on um, but but yeah, it's very much a kind of core part of our work is wanting to increase that awareness and put it into formats which is accessible to a range of audiences like mental health professionals through our um, education and training. Thanks. Well, it, it feeds very nicely into um, Brandon, who is um, involved directly in how we're translating some of the research that you're all generating into kind of policy and, and visibility globally. So, so Brandon, do you want to... Um, just briefly talk to us about your background and then some of the work you're doing at WHO, if that's okay. Sure, thank you so much, Sarah, and thanks everyone for having me today. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so I am a technical officer in the mental health unit at WHO. Um, and part of my, or one of my roles, I guess, is serving as the focal point in our unit uh, for the integration of mental health and psychosocial support, uh, MHPSS, it's a term I'll throw around a bit today. If, and if you haven't heard it before, it's um, referring to, it's, it's the term WHO and much of the humanitarian system uses to describe activities and supports to support mental health and well-being in emergency settings. Um, and I think this is very much linked to climate change and the climate crisis, because within this work, we, we focus a lot on mental health and, and climate change. And we see emergencies increasing more and more because of the climate crisis. Um, I'm also a co-chair of a working group focused on disaster risk reduction and climate change within the Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support, very long name, uh, but it's a unique collaboration of UN, NGO, and other actors working together in, in humanitarian settings, and we're sort of progressing more and more in this area. Um, so I'll, I'll be speaking more from the angle of um, emergency and, and risk reduction, and this is just because of uh, seeing more and more emergencies from 
climate related hazards because of uh, the increasing climate crisis and environmental crises. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So I want to tell you a bit about what we've been doing at WHO in the past few years to address the mental health impacts of climate change. Um, and we've been doing this both within WHO across uh, departments and also through WHO's role as a co-chair of this interagency group I just mentioned. Uh, and that's really because to address this problem, we, we have to work together across sectors, across agencies. We really can't do it alone. Um, in recent years, we've been ramping up activities by mapping and partnering with key actors in the field who are working on preparing for and responding to the mental health and, and psychosocial impacts of climate change through a lot of disaster risk reduction programs. And, and on the screen here, you just see it, just a few examples of the many projects that are ongoing globally that we're trying to learn from and also support in, in preparing for um, climate related hazards across the world. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so we've also used some of the lessons we've learned from those good practices uh, just, just highlighted in the previous slide to develop an approach to respond to the mental health impacts of climate change. Uh, and this is sort of documented and then laid out in the Interagency Standing Committee's uh, recently published guidance note on linking disaster risk reduction with mental health and psychosocial support. It's sort of the first interagency multi-sectoral guidance uh, focusing on MHPSS preparedness, disaster risk reduction, and, and preparing for and responding to climate-related emergencies. Um, we also have a number of other tools that I think are relevant for preparing for and responding to and recovering from uh, the climate crisis. So these are pictured here on the screen. I, I won't mention each one of them, but um, they're, they're all sort of relevant in an all phase cycle, uh, all phase approach we, we think about at WHO for uh, addressing climate change. Um, Lastly, I'd say we, we're spending a lot of time in trying to raise the profile of preparing for what is to come with climate change in terms of mental health impacts. And uh, I think most recently this has been demonstrated through the, the update to the Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan, where WHO's member states, these are countries all over the world, have, have agreed to include a new indicator on having functional MHPSS preparedness programs in place. And they report on these in a yearly basis um, to, to describe their functionality and whether they exist or not. So it's a sort of a new commitment from countries all over the world to try to better prepare for public health emergencies, uh, natural hazards, conflicts, um, which I think there are many, many of which will increase only as we as we move forward due to climate change. So I think it's a nice development. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and this is sort of just, just the start of where we're going in this area. There are also a number of other inter initiatives underway. Um, we're trying to support through interagency uh, partnership, the, the intervention journals having a special section on mental health and psychosocial support and climate crisis. So how are people responding, sort of documenting effective approaches and, and contributing to building the evidence. Um, we're developing key messages and, and sort of advocacy strategies for country level working groups who are heavily affected by climate change to, to advocate for more uh, mental health integration. Um, soon we'll be releasing a policy brief for uh, governments to, to sort of have some recommendations on what WHO would say should be done to address mental health in the context of climate change. And we're also working on operational tools and training packages to um, build capacity for preparing for emergencies, including climate related emergencies moving forward. Um, that's a quick highlight of, of what we're doing. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Brandon, that's amazing overview. Thank you very much. Um, can I just quickly ask again a sort of clarification question here, but how much how much teeth do these policy briefs actually have in country? I mean, my experience coming from infectious diseases that, you know, WHO and UN make these extraordinary, very powerful policy brief statements. But actually how how we can make sure that they are implemented in particular in settings that we're going to talk about today where they have enormous um, pressure on resources um, across the board, not just uh, mental health. And, and can you just explain how WHO sees that? working 
Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a key question, really. There's a lot that you can write and say in a policy brief, but how you actually do it is is the question. So I think that's what comes next is sort of we set out recommendations, but it's up to to WHO uh, and other partners and governments to work together on actually operationalizing what that means. So often we we do hear from governments that there's interest in, in working on certain aspects, but we need to have tools to do that. So that's where we hope to go with some of our operational packages that are in development. And um, we also hope that at least these recommendations increased investment. So from there, there, there can be a bit more action. And is there any sort of collective global initiative? For example, in, in my world, in, there's the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria which I'm sure you're very familiar with, but is there anything like that that, that is going to look at different aspects of, of climate climate change? Um, you know, I think there, that I wish, uh, I think there are donors who are becoming more and more interested in this intersection of mental health and climate change, uh, but there is, there's not yet something like the scale of the global fund for mental health. That would be amazing, uh, maybe someday. Maybe they need to make it broader. Mm -hmm. Okay, I won't preempt the questions. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's great to talk to you. Um, so our, our next speaker is, is Tilly, who's based at the Red Cross uh, Climate Centre, and, and she's a technical advisor there focusing on, again, climate and health, which is very pertinent to our conversation here. Um, Tilly, do you want to um, give us a brief summary of, of your work to date? Um, and I know you've got specific questions about some of the research you're doing right now, which may well be uh, relevant for us to talk about. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sarah. And it's really a pleasure to be with you all here today presenting some of the work that we've done at the Climate Centre. The Climate Centre, um, it's a technical reference centre within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. And our aim is to really help the movement and the Red Cross partners um, reduce the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events on vulnerable people. And within that, we actually have quite a number of priority areas, including, for example, anticipated reaction and conflict, social protection. And the team that I sit within uh, focuses on health. Um, other research that we do includes um, climate resilience of health systems, um, climate finance and health, and a lot of assessments on the climate change impacts on health. And that's what I wanted to be able to speak with you um, today and present some of the findings from 11 assessments that we ran, um, looking specifically at the climate change impacts on health and livelihoods um, in Malawi, Kenya, Ethiopia, Mongolia, Myanmar, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Fiji, and Timor-Leste. So quite a wide range of countries, um, climate risks, uh, and also, yeah, um, socio-demographic backgrounds, as well as conflict settings. What we really found in them is that climate change can put a lot of pressure on livelihoods and health and create shocks leading to the loss of homes, family members, displacement from communities, loss of ancestral lands, loss of ancestral burial grounds, permanent dislocation from, for example, coastal areas um, or pastoral lands, which then disrupt tr traditional ways of living, all of which can lead to psychological stress, anxiety and depression. In each of those 11 assessments, we have a specific section on mental health, but we do also cover, say, um, infectious diseases or impacts on climate, um, on health systems, sorry. Uh, but what I'm presenting today is a summary of uh, those 11 sections on the mental health. Uh, impacts and overall I really just have to stress was that there was limited research and data um, across all contexts when it comes to the climate change impacts on mental health. All of our research um, in this was based off secondary data so peer-reviewed literature or large humanitarian reports um, and in each country we had to say there is really very limited um, studies being published and potentially very limited data out there. Um, some of, the, some of the main findings that we had was um, heat stress. Uh, so heat is one of the most um, certain things that we know when it comes to the change in climate, that the temperatures are increasing. Um, so heat stress on the body was linked with reduced well-being. And it was also a lot about diminish, diminishing livelihoods um, and increased poverty being linked with increased levels of anxiety and depression. Um, changing seasons, especially lower rainfall, was likely to be increased with, uh, was likely to be associated with increased worry and despair, especially in farmers and pastoralists who are finding um, it more and more challenging uh, to find land for, for livestock um, and also having to travel further to find appropriate land, sometimes bring them into the lands of other people, which can then also create tensions. Um, 
in Nepal, as one of the examples, the changing climate um, and seasons is increasing the seasonal migration of men, meaning that many families are also being left behind in the villages. Um, and this puts an especially big burden on women who not only are having to do extra chores, but also may face increased stigmatization in the community for their husbands having to be away for longer periods of time. Um, we also find some evidence of the increased rural to urban migration overburdening already weak health systems in the urban areas. Um, so for example, in Mongolia, the huge influx um, of people towards the capital has resulted in a high number of people not being registered and thus not being able to access health services, which will then not only be very important for physical health, but also mental health and well-being. Um, there were really complex interactions between climate and conflict and how this relates then to migration and displacement. Um, not only that climate and conflict can create very traumatic experiences, but the process of also being of being displaced is another um, added layer. And I just have to note that um, these assessments were conducted before the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan or the coup in Myanmar. So the, that aspect of the conflict is not captured um, in these in these assessments. But it links very much to cumulative shocks um, that we were finding repeated um, exposure and cumulative shocks, um, reduced healthy coping strategies and was linked um, with increased levels of despair and potentially also with increased um, substance abuse, where we find some examples um, of reports done in um, some of the Pacific islands in which after extreme weather events, there were higher incidences of substance abuse and then potentially intimate partner violence. Um, we also, for, for many of these islands, also or coastal areas, um, we're reading into sort of what does uh, relo what do relocation plans look like and what does that mean for people also. Um, and in some instances, there are forced relocation plans, and though they might be very well-meaning, may have unintentional negative consequences as people lose access to traditional livelihoods or places and spaces that they felt extremely well connected to beforehand. Um, and then that also links then with um, one of the very first points about the diminishing livelihoods and increased poverty leading to anxiety and depression. Um, so whilst I have here like managed to outline quite a few different strands, I would still stress that the, the, the evidence and data on this in a lot of the context that we work in the humanitarian, especially in humanitarian settings are really, really limited. Um, next slide, please. And if you are interested in um, reading any of these reports, they are all available online at the Climate Centre. Um, and then hopefully I'll get to talk about this a little bit more, but we do have a partner, almost sister centre, who is a psychosocial um, centre who really focuses on mental health and wellbeing um, and psychosocial support uh, um, within the humanitarian sphere of, of everything that the Red Cross does. Um, and I'll direct you more towards some of their resources also. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tilly, and thank you to all of you, because that's a really amazing tour de force of, of all sorts of fascinating um, work that's been ongoing. I mean, again, for me, the, the idea of forcing change, I mean, perhaps I'm being overly simplistic here, is we have to identify what we think the problem might be and then look to do the research to go, were we right? Is there a problem? I think what we've heard just now is clearly there is an enormous problem. Um, and then we move to people like um, Brandon and Tilly to help us sort of implement change, uh, both through government and policy, but also through actually, you know, going out there to these different communities and looking at what they want and need. Um, the first question, and I, I just want to um, go back to you, Tilly, is you've done enormous amounts of work and it's fantastic to see all this, all these resources. Can you just explain to us what actually happens with these pieces of information you, you have, who, who reads them and, and how can we help? Again, the, 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 it's speaking to the visibility question of, of how you, you implement change once people have got to read these things first. Great question. And the key question, like Brandon said as well, of what is translating that research into the action? So all of these reports and, and the, the whole way that the Climate Centre functions as a technical reference centre within the Red Cross movement, is that these assessments were done in conjunction with the national society of the given country. So say the National Society of the Maldives or Af Afghanistan or Pakistan. So from the very outset, um, it was a, a co-researched, co-designed piece of work um, where there was a lot of key informed interviews also run in country, not only with the National Society, but also with other stakeholders, including in the Ministry of Health. Um, 
to try and gather up as much information that we could, because the point of these assessments is for the national societies to use them in their own program design and moving forward when they're then when they're looking at their annual strategies. Um, many of the national societies, um, in fact, all of them have a health department already and will be having many um, psychosocial support um, services on offer. And so what we wanted to do as part of these assessments, which, like I mentioned at the beginning, cover a whole range of, of different health, negative health outcomes from um, mm. climate change, is offer um, guidance and suggestion on what trends are worth following or focusing on in terms of programmatic decision making. Um, and certainly mental health came up as one where there is huge underfunding, not many, many actors being interested, but currently still not enough being done. And so a great space for the national societies um, being able to contribute that because, and I don't know how familiar um, everyone is necessarily with the structure of, of the Red Cross movement, but there will be um, national societies headquarters based in the capital, and then chapters based in districts right down to the community level. Um, and so that can really flow through a lot of a lot of services and information right down to community levels very, very quickly and efficiently. Um, and these assessments were then produced with the headquarters um, in each of the countries, as well as chapter um, members of staff and, and volunteers. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, it'll get used in terms of those um, strategies there. Thank you. Well, I, I hope I hope this amazing work gets out there. That's why I keep asking this question. Can I move to sort of Emma and, and, and Jessica, perhaps, because you, you're pulling together sort of lots of um, broader questions in, in the work you're doing. And obviously, the other really important thing is to educate the next generation, hopefully many of on, on this call, who are our undergraduates and postgraduates who are also going to be working in this field, I hope. But um, how, how do you find um, sort of engaging these different communities in, in to get the research going and, and get the education working? Yeah, I think, again, it's a it's a great question because and, and a key strand of what we're trying to do is not only better understand, but translate that into better awareness and more action. So um, just to say, first of all, it is true that uh, many people um, learning about these kind of issues at universities or in schools, like learning about the facts of the climate crisis, we're hearing that that is um, understandably causing strong emotional responses and sometimes distress that without the right support and without um, the sort of uh, sort of mental health um, expertise or my skill sets going around that uh, educational piece about climate change or about climate change impacts is then becoming overwhelming to the point that people are saying well maybe I don't want to work in this space you know how do I equip myself to actually continue to um, do this research or embed this into my into my career into my work how do I navigate this um, and of course that reflects you know what we're people who are aware about the facts of climate change just within society in general are sort of grappling we're all grappling with these sort of emotional and psychological responses so there's clearly a need um, within all of the educational parts of you know learning about climate change in any setting which is you know we need every career to be a climate career moving forward to embed this across the whole societal transformation there's a clear need to think about how do we equip people to to cope with this and how do we equip people to act and the big part of that action is that we need people to connect and that can help with um, coping, but also help with with acting. And we need to connect to these more hopeful narratives as well around what, um, you know, that there are many things that we can do to create hope through our actions. So what we're trying to do in terms of um, raising that awareness and, and education is to develop the resources that can be used and can be slotted into these different communities, whether it's resources for parents, resources for teachers, resources for um, university educators, resources for um, mental health professionals, you know, and the, the key thing is to have those be agile so that they can be can be used, used by different groups. But again, to um, help people go through that process of reflecting themselves um imagining that world they want to see and, and giving them the tools um, to be able to act as well because that action both uh collectively um and at all all levels of all systems is is what's needed um but ultimately of course you know one of the key groups is 
policy and decision makers because we need them to come together and act as well and you know that is also about the way that they're thinking and feeling the way that they're connecting the way that they're drawing drawing these dots across sectors so we see this work to develop these resources and also create the spaces um, and workshops for people to come together discuss these issues and take action as a core part of what we do thank you I mean, there's quite a few uh, questions in the chat and, and um, i think some of them are quite relevant to this conversation I, i'm going to invite sophia and emma who who organize this whole event so I, I don't want them to go um in a kind of un, unspoken way but perhaps you might want to pick out some questions that that speak to kind of what can we actually do and um how, how with all of us listening to these um these conversations where where does that fit in yeah hi everyone um so uh we have had a few different questions coming in um i'm just picking up on um, one of the more um, recent ones. Uh, as, as humans, um, this comes in from uh, Kev, um, we need to act powerfully at a local level. Um, so what, what does that flow look like on the ground um, so, that, so that we can apply that in the UK uh, in terms of a, a bottom-up over top-down kind of policy? Who, who might want to answer that? I, I, I don't know, maybe... Um... Emma, did you say you wanted to, or, or I was just thinking of, of uh, Jessica or Tilly as well, but perhaps Emma, do you want to start? I'm, I'm happy to add to some, you know, I just spoke, so if someone else wants to jump in and I can add something. That's... I can just jump in quickly about um, that bottom-up approach is so important about learning from communities that are already doing a lot of this and that needs to be really central to decision-making processes. So for example, indigenous communities are some most vulnerable to the impacts of um, on their mental health and climate change, but also have such valuable insight to share about how to mitigate and how to adapt to the effects of climate change. So putting those experiences as really central in those kind of policy making decision making processes is absolutely essential. Um, and that goes for all of the voices of the people who are most vulnerable and do have lived experience of those mental health impacts. Um, and that is as Emma's talking about kind of creating those spaces of linking communities and linking decision makers and creating those spaces to kind of share that and hopefully reimagine how we can make those um, those decisions that's very much something that we we hope to to help with Jessica yeah. when you say decision makers who is that who is that person you know it can be so many people and that's part of the the challenge is that so many people are decision makers but they're operating in silos whether that's around mental health policy or climate policy and there's not enough kind of dialogue happening between them and there are so many policies that can have so many co-benefits for climate and mental health but that can't ever happen unless people are talking to each other across sectors whether that's um kind of leaders in communities leaders in government working across health or transport or energy um, that's the the real challenge where you know there there are so many players in this but there's just not enough of them talking to each other and, and Tilly do you have any experience from your work in in you know the, the Red Cross sites that you've um, shown us some of the the work you've been doing do you how do you feel that those communities themselves um, understand what's available to them yeah absolutely and I'm sorry if I before I suggested a much more unidirectional approach um, within the Red Cross movement. It, it's anything but that um, by by all means, because the volunteers are, are from communities. That, and this is the same case in the UK also, that you will have volunteers from, where was it, Goldming in Surrey, um, who are part of the Red Cross movement, who can then benefit from a lot of the training um, that is developed um, say at headquarters and bring that to communities much more but also the really key point is a lot of the discussion happening between volunteers and community members getting fed back up into decisions being made at headquarters levels and so some of the things that I have seen that volunteers have been involved in are talking circles for example or also um, lots of awareness raising amongst communities where access to information on climate change impacts might not be as easily available as it is for us here. Um, a lot of um, involvement in schools and getting kids involved. Um, and then lots more about just generally improving the, the social cohesion and, and environmental health of communities. So this, this is in many programs um, uh, across the Red Cross movement um, and in the UK also. And so I would just, uh, yeah, if there is interest, definitely look up local 
um, local volunteering options, being able to check up on neighbors, checking up on vulnerable um, elderly populations or, or anyone that maybe doesn't, isn't able to get out as easily or go to other the groups and, um, and just mobilize as much as possible. That is really what the Red Cross is, is trying to do through its volunteer movement and staff, mobilize as much as people as possible to be aware and to be able to take the action that they can at the scale that they can with the resources available. Thank you, Tilly. Um, just moving slightly, there's a couple of questions that maybe I'll, I'll address to you, Brandon, if that's okay, uh, about, again, this, this really key piece of, of kind of translating the, the evidence and the research and the emotion into policy and actually, so one, one asks, given it's such a cross-cutting issue, how does the WHO work with other UN agencies and institutions, including universities, to join up and enhance what you're doing? And uh, there's another question, uh, similarly, Brandon, that goes, do you think policy and decision makers have much understanding of climate feedback loops and, and what's going on? I think they're both uh, interesting questions and difficult ones, but I'm happy to try to address them. So at WHO, we, we play a, a coordinating and a convening role, but we, we never do things alone. And that's, that's key. Uh, we work a lot in this specific area through the Interagency Standing Committee, which I, I mentioned earlier. It's a large collaboration of 60 organizations, uh, UN agencies, NGOs, Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, uh, and academic partners, where we sort of convene together an interagency approach to addressing the mental health impacts of climate change. So um, WHO co-chairs this along with the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent Society. So this is one way we work We work together, I think, with partners, and that's really the only way to do this. Um, a lot of the work within that, that uh, collaboration is about emphasizing the cross-cutting nature of mental health. Uh, we, we, I think this has kind of already been said, a few times, but we really try to emphasize how it's not just mental health in health sector or protection or education. It's really relevant across sectors. And that's extremely true when we talk about climate change action, uh, mitigation, adaptation. Mental health plays a role in, in, in a lot of the different sectors that are relevant. So people need to talk together, as Jessica was saying. Um, it, it can't be a siloed approach. And, and I think we recognize that. Um, the, the second question about uh, do, do governments recognize um, climate feedback loops, correct? Um, I think that's a tough question. I think some do and some are, are still learning. Um, but that's part of, part of our effort is to really raise this awareness uh, to try to cr increase investment in mental health um, by sort of demonstrating what there is in, in, the, in, in the literature. Um, I think policy briefs are one way of doing that because they distill massive numbers of papers into five, 10 pages. Um, Emma's work has been very nice on, on their policy brief in doing that and showing the, the impacts. Uh, and I think that there's a big value there and, and showing why this is important. There's a lot more to be done though. There's a lot of advocacy to be done and events like this are important. Um, events on, on global stages like the COP26, for example, there were some conversations around mental health and climate change, some for the first time. Um, so it, it's gaining recognition, but there's more to be done. And Brandon, I think your point made about um, the sort of siloed research, but also the siloed funding is, is one of the problems that we all work with. Um, what, one of the questions, and maybe I'm being a bit harsh to you, because you're the, you're, you're our man on the panel, is that, you know, from, from work I've done over the years in infectious diseases and, and particularly in HIV, the stigma of mental health and the stigma of being ill full stop or the stigma of being non-resilient to whatever is going on in your environment is felt significantly more by um, men than women. And, you know, we're comfortable in this organisation or this group talking about mental health, but how, how do you feel this plays out? And maybe others have got research on this by gender. Um, because people may not want to come forward and say, I am feeling very depressed or suicidal because of what's going on in my environment. And, and how do we look at that? It's a great question. I think, um, I think everyone experiences stigma. I will say that. I do think that you're right that um, we see in many, in many low and middle income countries, it's much more difficult to engage men in, in mental health and psychosocial support interventions. Um, but stigma is a problem, I think, across the board. And, and I think that's part of what, you know, there's a question about what we can do as individuals. 
uh, I think this can be addressed at all levels, but what we can do as individuals is, is really supporting each other and being open about mental health uh, and, and well-being and, and not phrasing it as something we need to hide or, or tuck away, but something we can support all of our, so all of our communities uh, on. I think that's the first step in addressing um, stigma. And, you know, I would also say when it comes to the impacts of climate change on mental health, there's a lot of terminology that we hear, um, you know, new phrases, I guess, and, and there's, I think, a, a lot of work to be done on defining those. But in any case, I think we can really recognize a lot of this as, as normal reactions to an overwhelming uh, and, and very difficult situation that the world faces. So the more we're able to, to package things and describe uh, reactions and experiences in, in a normalizing way rather than a, a stigmatizing way, the better. Yeah. Sure. There's there's a question in the chat that maybe Tilly you want you want to um, respond to in the first place, but obviously it's relevant to everybody. Is has there been much research which disaggregates the data on the mental health impacts of climate change according to different demographics? So gender, age, race. I suppose that's what we've just, just talked about a little bit, uh, and the data that suggests that the climate change impacts different groups differently. I think you mentioned some of that in your presentation, didn't you? But there's there's clearly some gaps here, and and I feel like gender might be one important one. Yes, definitely, it's a great question, um, and was uh, a big frustration of ours when doing this piece of work. In that that data didn't we? It, maybe it exists in certain pockets, but we definitely couldn't find it um, uh, to the level that we wish to have um, for the comprehensive nuts that we wish that we were able to do in these um, reports. So I would say it doesn't exist um, so easily, though we did have some examples on um, flooding in Pakistan, a report done by UNICEF, um, where they were really looking at the, the impacts on children um, and uh, found there that often also the, the response of adults hugely impacted then the children's response and sort of psychosocial well-being thereafter, which you could then extrapolate also being um, to, well, what was it about the socioeconomic status also of the parents that maybe meant that they felt more able to be able to respond, had more social capital to draw on to help the family get through this, or, or any of those hugely important contextual factors um, that would have influenced what the outcome was. Overall, I would say that we don't have as much of that um, disaggregated data, and it was a, a huge recommendation um, of us to, to really try and capture that a lot more, because it is clear that in some circumstances, um, women are likely to be more impacted than men, but in other circumstances, through occupational hazards, men are, are potentially likely to be more impacted. So say, fishermen that go out for 20 days at a time out at sea, maybe don't have radios on the boats. If a cyclone comes through and they have had no warning, um, that can be particularly catastrophic um, to men disproportionately there because women are unlikely to be out on fishing boats in certain contexts. Um, so yeah, great question and would love there to be more um, disaggregated data. Uh, Emma, do you want to add your thoughts to that question? Yeah, just, just quickly to add that, yeah, I agree more data and evidence is needed, but we do know in general in, you know, in disasters, um, and the ones that climate change uh, exacerbates as well, that it is often women and children who bear the greatest burden. And um, we also know that, of course, climate change exacerbates inequalities massively, including inequalities in mental health um, around the world. So people who already have um, pre-existing mental illnesses are more likely to be affected. They're more likely to die in a heat wave. They're more likely to have worsened mental health um, through uh, these either climate change induced um, mm. threats and impacts. And uh, yeah, and so similarly, we also hear a lot that, well, is climate um, sort of anxiety and distress around awareness of climate change, is that something that's only where you, you're worried about that if you don't have other worries, that you're worried about that if you're in a rich country actually more than if you're directly affected. And we see that the data says that's not the case. So the biggest survey um, to date around uh, emotions and um, worries around climate change and the impact on the lives of young people globally and other um, relevant research studies has shown that it's the countries where people are most affected. So countries like the Philippines actually seem to have the highest level of like worry and distress and strong emotions and worries around their future, understandably because of climate change. Mm -hmm. So this distress is not just coming 
from um, people who don't have something to worry about. It's understandably stronger in people who are already seeing this um, happen before before their own eyes. I, I suppose there's a sort of, unfortunately, there has to be some degree of hierarchy. And, and perhaps if we can disaggregate the data, if you're a government and you're challenged with where do you put your diminishing amount of available resources, if you have data from the research communities that can say these are the populations that are much more vulnerable, I mean, stating the obvious, everybody's vulnerable, but these are the populations that are perhaps more vulnerable. I, I don't know, I, I'm making that up. Is that something, Brandon, that you feel that would be useful for, for in-country sort of, you know, d directives? I mean, you know, we it's again a balance of not overwhelming, but at the same time going, let's be rational and, and pragmatic here. Yeah, I think that's key. Um, I think particularly in many low and middle income countries that we know are more heavily impacted by climate change, typically. Mm. Um, I think, though, I would say with mental health, investment is a problem no matter where you're looking uh, in, across the world. We know this only about 2% of health budgets from governments on average are spent on, on mental health expenditure. Um, and, and that's a, a major problem. Um, so I think when we talk about investing in mental health, some of the same problems we see in, in general development of mental health systems is, is contributing here as well. Um, so, so prioritizing groups, prioritizing areas, working to, to capture at least the, those things you can is, is key, yeah. And just to ask Jessica, just from the research side of it, has anybody looked at uh, the economic impact? So if you only have 2% of your budget for mental health and you had an argument to say, okay, let's make that 10%, is, are there key outcomes for a government that goes, look, guys stay in school, people work better? I, I don't know, but you know, those are things that we might find more evidence to support um, investment. That's a great question and having economic arguments is always helpful for policy makers. <laughs> so, absolutely, I don't know how much is there that way around and Emma might be able to add more to that, uh, more of the economic side I've seen is more about what we know that climate change has massive disruption to health systems. So mm. that's going to only increase the economic burden um, and increasing by increasing the mental health burden, therefore also increasing the economic side. So I've only seen it that way around, not the other, but Emma might be able to add. Yeah, sure. Just to quickly say it is a big gap that we haven't fully quantified this hidden, huge, significant cost of climate inaction on mental health um, and vice versa. You know, the, the benefits of action are not for mental health and well-being and not being accounted for in sort of climate policies and mental health policies. Um, but we know there's loads of evidence that uh, investment in mental health has huge returns and oh. an investment in prevention, investment in early intervention has huge returns. And so, but a lot of those things we need to do to prevent mental health difficulties in the first place, um, like having uh, better community psychosocial support, more connected communities, healthier environments, these sort of things um, we know sort of align with climate action and are synergistic with climate action, but they also uh, will be disrupted by climate change. So again, you know, we need to take these things into account together. And I think that just leads into um, a question that's really been in the chat around the sort of intervention space and investing in interventions and what we what we know. And we know that there are examples where people are training, um, you know, community health workers to be more aware of this and and um, actually seeing that. Uh, the effects of climate change on communities are a way in to talk to people about mental health and well-being in situations where they might have otherwise stigma around talking about um, how they're feeling. But when something's happening, maybe the community is more open to talking about that. So there are examples of, of people training communities. There are examples of um, communities saying, you know, there is this need, we need to create support so after a wildfire coming together and creating ways for communities to talk together to provide support for each other um, there are lots of programs like force of nature the good grief network susty vibes in nigeria that's a, a youth um, sort of support and action program there are these great examples around the world but we just need to bring them together and better evaluate and better scale up which is something that we are working on um, at climate cares in in um, kind of mapping that space and trying to also 
create infrastructure like networks and hubs and the things we've been discussing to showcase that back to everyone else and share that learning. Um, but yeah, again, the, the funding for that has been challenging because there is, you know, funding is occurring in silos. Is it? So it's all kind of a chicken and egg problem a bit at the moment. But just to say there are these examples. And when we take action together as communities, there are, you know, economic benefits that need to be quantified. But there's also, you know, we just see that there's, it's a, it's a virtuous cycle of being able to better cope, better act, um, and, and that we can really transform societies in the directions that we want to go. Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm suddenly worried that we're about to end as we've got really interesting questions coming through. So Brandon, just quickly um, commented, do you want to just speak your comment about the funding side? Sure, I, I can just say um, generally, WHO has good estimates on return on investment in uh, care for common mental health conditions. And we know uh, about on average, it's every $1 spent on, on that care returns about $4. And, and increased productivity. Um, there's a lot of estimates we've done on how you could actually provide uh, basic care for common mental disorders like depression, anxiety, for as low as four or, three, four or five dollars per person. Um, th there's, there's good economic modeling, I think, generally on uh, care for mental health conditions. Now, when it comes to climate change, I think that's very difficult to, to do, but it'd be interesting to see what the cost of an action is there as well. Uh, I'm sure it's quite high. You know, we you know generally just depression and anxiety alone cost the global economy about one trillion dollars every year. So um, I'm sure it will just only increase with with climate change. So just to to finish off, I've got one question that I'd like each four of you to answer now, which is, what are you most hopeful about in the achieving the SDG three that we've just had a very brief talk to? Um, today in the next year? I don't know who wants to start. Tilly, perhaps you can start with that. I think what I'm most hopeful for, and maybe this is, yeah, taking it right back to like a personal um, layer, is having many, many more of these discussions, having these discussions on platforms here, having these discussions with colleagues um, throughout, for, for me, within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Um, and really taking the action at that local level. So I really appreciated um, that question a lot because I do also fully agree that the more we can do at the grassroots, the more we will see shifts um, up at the big policy levels. Um, and I think that there has been a huge, just in the, the time space that I've been working on climate change and health, I think that there has been a huge shift towards taking mental health seriously and, and thinking about well-being. Um, so I'm really pleased with that. Well, thinking about how all these things interact as well on, on mental health as a, as a measurable outcome, which I think often it hasn't been up to now. Jessica, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with Tilly about the awareness side and more of these conversations happening is fantastic. And I think there's so much hope and opportunity here for transformation, how we do things and reimagining how we make policies and make decisions in a way which is really centering communities and centering the voices of the people who are most vulnerable and working across silos. I think we've all been very much agreement in the need for that. And that's a real exciting opportunity to, you know, yes, imagining what we can do in mental health and climate change, but also in all the decisions we make in everything, there's so much potential there. So that's what I feel hopeful about. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, thanks. I think um, it is really exciting that more of these discussions are happening and awareness is growing. And when you talk about sort of measuring that, I think that people are embedding well-being into, you know, I know that OECD is creating well-being frameworks to embed that as sort of a unifying North Star across all of these kind of policy decisions and changing the way that we measure success. Um, and, you know, the Lancet uh, countdown on, on health, looking at how, how climate is impacting health, is developing metrics to measure the mental health impacts for the first time. So I think this is starting to change. Um, and I think we know there are things that we know that, uh, you know, not me, but other mental health professionals, um, you know, people working across the human sciences know in terms of how we can better equip communities, how we can support communities to cope and act. And there's a lot of expertise in the grassroots level of communities around the world who are already doing this, who are already supporting each other to cope and act. And so mm -hmm. I think with the right, if we can get that to translate into funding and support, then I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, bring that learning and that knowledge together and, and, um, and create resources and toolkits that can help this kind of spread through 
current uh, community infrastructure. So we're not reinventing the wheel, but we're supporting schools, universities, health systems to be able to embed this and, and create those spaces for people to come together. Because we know people want to act. We know that people care about climate change much more than they think other people do, um, but it's creating those opportunities. So we align that uh, that action, we connect people, and that is going to be so good for mental health and well-being, mm -hmm. as well as um, you know creating that social fabric to to cope with and act on climate change. Thank you. And, and lastly, Brandon, I, I mean, I think it's been incredibly helpful to have this spread of you all with your different perspectives. And thank you for joining. So just for, from our point of view, what do you feel is, is the most hopeful way we can think of in the next year even to, to achieving the SDG 3? Thank you. I, I, think we're, I think we're a long ways from SDG 3 and 3.4, specifically as it relates to mental health promotion. But I think we've said it, the, the agenda is really increasing and we're seeing more and more attention now as it comes from governments. Uh, in, in the World Health Assembly last year, there were an incredible number of countries who were speaking about mental health for the first time. Uh, so the profile is, is really raising and it's continuing to raise. Um, it happened again in WHO's executive board meeting this, this January where Again, just countries we've never heard talk about mental health before are speaking about its importance and talking about investment. And uh, I think it, it's a, a massive reason for hope uh, in moving forward. Thank you. And I just want to thank everybody who's put uh, comments and questions into the chat. And I'm really sorry we haven't had a chance to get to them all. But what I like is the one at the end where it says that we've all got to look after each other uh, adaptation to mitigation and keep going keep strong and let's just keep talking um i just want to thank all of our panelists it's been an incredible um hour to have these really interesting conversations and let's hope we can keep working together and in particular i just want to thank sophie and sophia who have pulled all this together and it's part of their master's communications in science but they've done a great job um, and so thanks thanks to everybody who's joined our call and thank you to you, Sarah, for being an amazing chair. Great. Speak soon. Thanks very much, all. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>